So, as we've been looking in this mini-series, um, we've been covering the importance that context plays in proper, proper biblical interpretation. And, you know, we're now convinced uh, more than ever the importance of the three main rules, right, for proper interpretation, which are, and you already said it this morning, what are they? Context, context, and context. It's a lot like real estate, right? Location, location, location. It's context, context, and context. Context is the key for proper interpretation of the scriptures. It is the key. It is the thing that is generally uh, done wrong when, when you misinterpret it and it protects us in proper interpretation. Uh, uh, the context of the verse itself, you got a, a lot of times it's just taking a portion of a verse out of its own context, right? Uh, the context of the entire passage, uh, the whole thought of the section, um, the context of the chapter and the book, who wrote it, who, who, was, it, who was it written to, when was it written, um, and the context of the entire Bible. And, and honestly, sometimes you really have to look at the whole of the scriptures to, to properly understand what that verse is saying. Um, and so we need to be students of the word, right? And that's something that I'm never going to stop encouraging you to. And you may say, Pastor, I am. I say, great, get deeper, go further, read it more. Right? You're never going to get to a point where you're like, I've, I've arrived, I'm there, I'm, I'm studying the word of God enough. No, go more, like read more. Be a student of the word. I know that the more I read it, the more I study it, the more I realize I don't know anything. Like I'm just continually growing as I read the word of God, and, and so we never stop. We've identified five reasons that are often the cause for these verses, or verses in general, to be taken out of context. Number one, the deliberate misuse of God's word for the purpose of deception. This, unfortunately, is often the case. Uh, the itchy ears of churchgoers who, who keep up for themselves teachers that tell them what they want to hear, not what the Bible says. Uh, the over-marketing of the scriptures. The many different translations that can be used uh, in an effort to manipulate the, uh, what, the meaning of the word. And then the balance between application and interpretation. You know, over-teaching application, under-teaching interpretation. You can overdo either side, right? You need to interpret properly and then bring, bring application. And, and that's the right way to do it. Uh, but a lot of times what happens is, is this, this focus on application with no good interpretation and that leads to some really bad uh, verses being taken out of context. So, um, so church, how, and by the way, I, I'm going to dial down the dad jokes this, this week. I got, I got a lot of guff from my kids. They're like, dad, the dad joke meter was up to like 10 last week. And, and y'all were judging me, and probably rightfully so. But how many times have you heard someone say, money is the root of all evil? Raise your hands. How many times have you heard that one? Maybe not directly, but on TV or you read it somewhere, it was quoted somewhere. Money is the root of all evil. As if the abolition of money, if we just got rid of money, we would cure the world of evil. Because that's what that statement says. Money is the root of all evil. So if we could just live in a society without money, we wouldn't have evil. Isn't that what that says? That is what that says. That's actually the ideology of a lot of people. There's, there's big movements today that kind of have that un, as the undergirding of what they're trying to do. You know, uh, I'm not going to get political again. Every single one of these uh, weeks, last three weeks, I've been tempted to get all political, haven't I? But I'm not going to. But it, listen, the fact is that, that if we got rid of money, we would not get rid of evil in this earth. You understand that, right? Uh, but they would say, you're, you're not evil, it's the money that's evil. It's the, it, money's the root of all evil, not you. Uh, this is categorically false. The Bible actually tells us that our heart, the heart of man is what? Deceitfully wicked. Sin doesn't, we're not, money isn't the cause of our sin. We're the, we make money sinful. We, we, our desire for it, it starts in us. It begins with us. And listen, we will struggle with sin and evil in this world with or without money. 
It, it, it's not going to change that. Because we're the, we're the ones. It's us. It's, it's our problem. Uh, uh, we're the reason there's this evil in the world. Uh, money is not the root of all evil. That's simply not true, and it's not what the Bible says. Now, no doubt, this statement does come from the Bible, right? It's, it's a misquote, a taken out of context statement from 1 Timothy uh, chapter 6, verse 10. 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 10. Um, and the New King James Version reads, The love of money is a root of all kinds of evil. The love of money is a root of all kinds of evil. Not money is the root of all evil, right? Of, of everything that's evil. And, and so clearly, we don't even really need to go any further than the verse, right, itself to go, okay, that's saying something entirely different than this common statement we hear from the world. And honestly, an ideology that is, is accepted by many that if we could just get rid of money, we would get rid of evil. You know, it's the source. It's the reason. Because they don't want to look back at themselves and go, wait a second, I'm the reason. It's my greed. It's my desires that causes the problem, not, not just simply money. Now, it is, this is an interesting verse uh, to, to do this with, right? Because if, if you are a staunch King James person and you never open up another translation, um, then, then you're, you're probably used to this verse in a different way than I just read it. The King James reads, for the love of money is the root of all evil. It actually says, is the root of all evil, right? Whereas the New King James reads, the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil. Th those are actually quite different statements too, aren't they? But, but both of those reject the statement that money is the root of all evil, right? Both of those reject that. Either way, you wouldn't come up with that because both of them recognize that it's the love of money that causes this. It's the greed for money. Both of them put it back on us and say, no, 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 it's what you do with it. It's your problem, right? Um, let me just say this, that, and I'm not wanting to bash the KJV because I am a KJV fan, right? I think it's a great, great translation. But the NIV, the ESV, the ASV, the NASB, the New Living Translation, as well as the KJ, K, uh, the New King James Version, all agree that it should be translated is the is a root of all kinds of evil. And if you go into the original language, that is a, that is a better translation of the passage. And so um, that's what I'm going to work from uh, this morning, and I think that's the, the best way to go. But both of them, no matter which one you go with, disputes that statement. And that's the point I wanted to make there. So it's the love of money. It's the love of money. It's not an absolute statement regarding money being the root of all evil in the world, uh, no matter which translation we look at. Uh, the fact is, guys, that many heinous and evil crimes are committed that have absolutely nothing to do with money. That the, the motivation and what the person did and why they did what they did, money isn't connected to it at all. And so that statement is just categorically false. However, the warning found in this verse is very serious because the love of money causes sin to run rampant. The love of money is an incubator for evil. It's an incubator for evil. So there is, we have to recognize that. It can and it will produce all kinds of evil in us. And for that reason... It is often true when it's said, hey, just follow the money and you'll find the bad guy. Right? That, that is a truth oftentimes, right? If you chase the money, you come to the people behind the bad things that, that took place. That, in this world, that often is the truth because, man, the love for money will drive people to do some really insanely evil things. Right? Uh, and we want to stay away from that. Now, with all of that said, we're really trying to find the context of things, right? This is all about teaching you. And if you haven't caught that already, the purpose of this mini-series was to convince you that you need to look at the context to understand the passage, to, to help you to become better Bible students, 
so that you would go, in your mind, you go, wait a second, I need to get a few verses you know, before that and run, run a few verses past that so that I can properly understand what this says. And sometimes, like I said with Romans, you're like, I'm going all the way back to chapter 1 and you know, running back at this thing to understand what this says, right? Uh, so we want to do that here. And I think it might actually surprise you what the bigger context of this passage is uh, when we take it in context. And so we need to actually go back to 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 1. We need to start all the way back at verse 1 to get a running start at this to see what, uh, what is really being said in this passage regarding the love of money. And who is it talking to and, and how should we properly ap- apply the truth of this in our lives, right? So let's read that, chapter 6, verse 1 and 2 to start. Let as many bond servants as are under the yoke count their own masters worthy of all honor, so that the name of God and his doctrine may not be blasphemed. And those who have believing masters, let them not despise them because they are brethren, but rather serve them because those who are benefited are believers and beloved. Teach and exhort these things. Uh, This epistle of 1 Timothy is one of several epistles that we generally call a pastoral epistle. Uh, There's a number of them, and and the reason we call them pastoral epistles is they're dealing with the, the duties uh, the responsibilities of a pastor, or they're written to a pastor regarding the, the church life and structure and how you go about things within the church. And 1 Timothy um, is largely focused on instructing a church life with a, with a focus on the importance of teaching sound doctrine. So if you go through this 1 Timothy, you're going to come, you're going to find out over and over and over again, this this call to teaching sound doctrine is just repeated over and over and over again. Uh, In this particular passage, Paul is exhorting uh, Pastor Tim regarding how to instruct Christians who are also bond servants, especially those who are under the yoke of another Christian, okay? So this this is the context that we're running from. He's being told how to instruct a, a believer who is a bondservant, a slave. He's been saved, but he's, he's actually in a position of slavery at this point. He's not a free man, right? And, he, and he's, he's working for the benefit of another man, right? And, and, and he's talking to that guy, first dealing with the, the Christian who's in any kind of situation like that, and then highlighting the Christian who's whose master is actually a believer too, right? And he's telling them, hey, don't despise them. Don't, don't be bitter about your situation. So that what? So that the, the, the doctrine of God may not be blasphemed. So that you don't, you don't uh, misspeak and, and, and put a bad light on the word of God and the teachings of the church, right? You need to maintain that position faithfully as unto the Lord, right? And that's why. Today, of course, in context, what would we be talking about? The employee-boss relationship. The, you as an employee and, and then your employer, whether uh, the employer is the owner of the company or just the manager placed over you, and, and, then, and then the whole institution uh, of that company that is, uh, is paying you for your time, right? that is actually giving you money uh, there's an indenturedness to that, right? You understand that. Like, when you're there, your time is not your own. When you're there, they're paying you for it. So your time is their time, right? And so it's speaking to us in that context, right? And it's speaking to us, whether, whether our boss, uh, company, or whatever. If you work for a Christian company, God bless you, because there are so few left out there, right? Most of the companies we work for are, to be frank, they're evil. I mean, they're just after greed, and they're just not doing anything well. Um, and, and, and so this is speaking to us who are maybe working for those companies or those bosses or those people, right, uh, that we need to uh, do well and, and, and work hard for them, right? But it's also speaking to us if, if a boss is, or an owner of a company is a Christian and, and how we should not despise them. But, but even in that case, work that much harder because, hey, my benefit is benefiting a brother in the Lord. My work is benefiting a brother in the Lord, right? So Paul says at the close of, those, of verse 2, he says, Teach and exhort these things. Now look at verses 3 through 5. 
If anyone teaches otherwise, oh, okay, so now we're getting uh, to understanding where we're headed here. Teach and exhort these things. What things? Talking to bond servants to work hard for their masters and not to despise a Christian master, right? Okay, if anyone teaches otherwise and does not consent to wholesome words, he kind of throws in a bunch more stuff there, but the focus is what he just said, right? Even the words of our Lord Jesus Christ into the doctrine which accords with godliness, he is, the person who's teaching otherwise, proud, knowing nothing, but is obsessed with disputes and arguments over words from which come envy and strife and reviling and evil suspicions, useless wranglings of men of corrupt minds and destitute of the truth, who suppose that godliness of a, is a means of gain, from such withdraw yourself. Okay, listen. Paul says, if anyone teaches otherwise by teaching, by teaching the bond servant, the Christian bond servant, that they should not be content to serve their Christian master, knowing that their labor is benefiting a fellow believer, but instead they should recognize that their godliness is a means of gain. Do you see that that's the direct context? That's exactly where we're at. Listen, they're saying, you should be free to make your own money. You should be free to pursue your own happiness. God doesn't want you to just be a bond servant. He wants you to be rich in this world. He wants you to, to gain. He wants you to get ahead. Paul says, if anyone teaches otherwise, they are proud, knowing nothing, who suppose that godliness is a means of gain. From such, withdraw yourself. Does your mind go to the same place mine does when kind of put this together? Are you thinking of some of the same kind of public uh, things and, 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 and Christian, uh, loosely, let me put quotations, or Christian, um, not Christian doctrine that is preached as Christian doctrine? This, my friends, this church is a direct rebuke against the name it and claim it prosperity doctrine that honestly was born in the pits of hell. That doctrine is evil. It is not Christian. It has no roots in the scriptures whatsoever. It is absolutely opposite to what the Bible teaches. It is a damnable heresy, and it needs to be rejected entirely. It's built on the love of money. And the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil. And we need to reject that. We don't want to have that root in our lives. Listen, you don't want to have that root in your life. You don't want to have any love of money in your life. It's not going to produce anything good for you, for your family, for your loved ones, for your walk with Jesus, for your church. I'm afraid there are a lot of churches that are operating under that kind of doctrine. They have a love for money. And how many believers have, or, or people who are turned off by the church that's their number one problem. What do they say? The church just wants your money. And we want to defend and go, no, it doesn't. But you know what? They've probably been to a church that did. And it should never be that way. We actually go to great lengths to try to not be that church. You know what I'm saying? Like, we don't want to be, ever put that spin on something. If, if you have a struggle giving money, don't give. Like, don't. You should only give hilariously because God's like putting it on your heart something you want to do, right? But don't ever feel like we're beating you up for it. And I know we don't, right? I mean, I know we don't. But the love, the greed for money is such dangerous teaching. And that's what we're talking about. In contrast to the teaching that godliness is a means of gain, God wants you to be rich. God wants you to get out from that bondage. He has new doors, new ventures, new mountains for you to climb. You just need to go out there and claim it. That's what they'll sell you. In contrast to that teaching, Paul goes on, verse 6, he says, now godliness with contentment is great gain. That's the contrast. Godliness with contentment, that's great gain. To, to seek godliness in your life, to live as Christ would have you live and be content with where he has you, that is what gain looks like. That is where you will gain. Listen, I am not living for what I can get in this life. And if, if any of us are, 
That's the wrong road. We need to live for the next one. And you know what God wants me to do here in order to live for the next one? He wants me to be about the gospel of Jesus Christ. He wants me to walk in the Spirit, to live minute by minute, trusting Him for what is next. Obedient to His Spirit. That's what He wants from me. Not worried about, i got to get out from under this because all I'm doing is making money for that guy and I'm not putting money in my pocket and, and I need to put more money in my pocket so I better go get mine. And it's easy for us to go there, isn't it? Like, I know for me, it is easy. I, I'm like, I did sales for a long time. Sales is all about that, man. That's like, that's the drive of salespeople. And I'm like, well, Lord, help me to not do that. And you know how many times God opened up opportunities to share the gospel? And I knew that I had a choice to make. If I'm going to share the gospel, I'm going to lose the sale. And to my, I'm sure I did. I'm sure I wasn't perfect in it. But to the best of my uh, remembering, I, I was pretty consistent to do that. The thing is, I didn't lose all of those sales. I really lost some of them. Some of them is like, never call me back again. Right? When you call a guy a liar because he says he's been trying to follow Christ, but you know, anyways, he doesn't buy equipment from you. But I, I told a, a Muslim straight, to, straight across the table, I said, we do not serve the same God. Jesus is God. He still signed that quote that day. And it was all in God's hands, right? I wasn't going to try to get mine. That company went bankrupt. I watched all these guys flee. I went to Jesus. Do you want me to leave or do you want me to stay? What do you want me to do? And I consistently heard stay. And those are some really tough years. If you've gone through a company that's going through bankruptcy, I mean, like we, we like every day was like every phone call, I don't want to answer. I'm just getting yelled at all day long. And the Lord told me to stay. And I got offers. Hey, you can come over here and make more money. Yeah, but I feel like the Lord wants me to stay here because I'm a witness to these people. I'm getting to share with them truth, you know. The context, therefore, did I read that whole thing? I didn't. Let's read that. I didn't read it, did I? Now, godliness with contentment is great gain. Verse 7. For we brought nothing into this world, and it is clear, it is certain, we can carry nothing out. You never see a hearse pulling a U-Haul, right? You never see that. You can't take anything with you. And having food and clothing with these, we shall be content. But those who desire to be rich, and there's the problem, you desire riches, that's what your heart wants. They fall into temptation and a snare, and into many foolish and harmful lusts, which drown men in destruction and perdition, for the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil, for which some have strayed from the faith in their greediness, and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. The context, therefore, is speaking against teaching in the church and the choices we make as believers. It is not a commentary against the intrinsic evil of money. That's not what it's talking about. It is a call to the church, first to teach faithfully these things, but then also to walk in these things. The Bible never teaches us, listen, to seek to make this world just and righteous. And, it, you know, it's not going to be. No, instead, the Bible calls me and instructs me to do justice and to do righteousness. It calls me to do that. It calls you to do that. If you've trusted Christ for your salvation, He has told you, O oh man, what is good and what the Lord expects of you, but to do justly and to love Mercy, and to walk humbly with your Lord. That's a call to us. In this fallen world, greed will always exist. Money will always con continue to drive people to do evil things. We must rise above that and live for something greater than this world. We must live for Jesus, for the Gospel, for the future hope we have in Him. 
We must live in a way that everything I do is, is I have a concern for the salvation of those that are watching, of those that are with me, of my boss if he's not a believer, of the other employees if he is a believer. If your boss is a believer, and uh, if he is or she is, why? Do, I mean, it could be he or she, right? You better be careful how you talk about them around other employees. Right? You, you want to honor God in the way that you behave there. I got so much more to talk about this morning, and we are, I knew, I knew, I knew I wasn't going to get through all of it, but we'll do our best. 1245-ish, good for everyone. One of our favorite verses to quote to encourage each other is Philippians 3, verses 13 and 14. Philippians 3 says, Brethren, I do not count myself to have apprehended, but one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forward to those things which are ahead, I press forward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. You know, I almost feel bad about doing this with some of these verses. Uh, you know, because it's like we've lived with them in a certain context or a certain idea for so long and they've encouraged us in a certain way. And this one might surprise you. It, it may not surprise you. I don't know. Maybe you really thought this verse was saying this. But this verse is not talking about forgetting the mistakes of your past and, and moving forward. It, it, not at all. Not at all. That's, that's completely devoid of the context of this verse. But before I go any further, let, let me just say this. That Christian, that is something that you should do as a Christian. If you've trusted Christ for your salvation, if you've, if you've put your faith in Jesus... If, if you believe that all of your sin, if you know that all of your sin and all of your shame and all of your guilt was nailed to the cross with Christ and that the old man is dead and you live in the newness of the life of Jesus Christ, then you should leave all of that back there at the cross. And you should not carry that forward with you. And the, the Bible would not teach you to do that this just isn't the right verse to make that statement with, right? That's just not what this verse is saying. Paul isn't reflecting in, his, in this passage on his mistakes or on the terrible things he used to do when he was a Christian hunter, but on his many achievements and his claims to righteousness, this verse is about Paul dismantling his own pride, not putting his mistakes behind him. It's been used the other way so much, right? So much that we, we almost just naturally go that way. Maybe I'm the only one. Is there anyone else that has heard or used that verse in that other direction? Let's look at the context. <coughs> we actually need to start at chapter 1 of uh, uh, verse 1 of chapter 3 to get the full context. So let's go back to chapter 3 verse 1 and, and I'm just going to read through um, to, chapter, or to verse 14. You ready? You with me? Finally, my brethren, rejoice in the Lord. For me to write the same things to you is not tedious, but for you it is safe. Beware of dogs, beware of evil workers, beware of the mutilation. For we are the circumcision who worship God in the Spirit, rejoice in Christ Jesus, and have no confidence in the flesh. And this is where the context starts. Rejoice in, in, in Jesus. What does that mean? In the finished work of the cross and all that Jesus is. Rejoice in Jesus and not in the flesh. Have no confidence in the flesh and in the things that you have done. Though I also, Paul says, verse 4, might have confidence in the flesh. So this is the context. I have, if anyone else thinks they may have context in the flesh, I more so. Paul's like, you think that 
You could talk about the, the good things of your past, the righteousness you bring to the table, the, the, the good behavior and the things you've done and the way you've tried to keep the law. Let's compare notes. Let's compare notes, Paul says. Circumcised the eighth day of the stock of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, concerning the law, a Pharisee. And we always think of Pharisee as an absolutely negative thing, right? Because they, they were so hypocritical. But the Pharisee was also a person who was seeking to keep the letter of the law. Right? So concerning the law of Pharisee. I was, I was seeking to keep the letter of the law. Concerning zeal, how, how intense was I on this? Persecuting the church. He says, my zeal for the law and for the old covenant and for righteousness by the law was so great, I was attacking the church. Concerning the righteousness which is in the law, I was blameless. Paul says, if that could save you, I would have been saved. Like, if that was possible, I would have been one of those. He says, but what things were gained to me? All that that I did to, to be righteous in my own works. All of that. What was gained to me? These I counted loss for Christ. I look at all that and I say, yeah, that's nothing. Jesus is everything. That's nothing. That does nothing for me. Jesus does everything for me. Verse 8, Yet indeed I also counted all things lost for the excellence of the knowledge of Christ Jesus, Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish. That word rubbish, it's not a pretty word. It's dirty. I'm not going to go into details. Many of you already know. That I may gain Christ. Verse 9. And be found in Him. Not having my own righteousness. Paul just gave us the... He just gave us his list of all the things that would have made him righteous. I have no righteousness. The, the righteousness I have is because I'm found in Him. Not having my own righteousness, which is from the law, but that which is through faith. Faith in Christ, the righteousness which is from uh, the righteousness which is from God by faith, that I may know Him and the power of His resurrection and the fellowship of His sufferings being conformed to His death, if by any means I may attain to the resurrection from the dead. Not that I have already attained, for I am all uh, or am already perfected, but I press on that I may lay hold of that which. Uh, that for which Christ Jesus has also laid hold of me. Brethren, I do not count myself to have apprehended. In other words, I haven't arrived. I'm not there yet. I'm continuing to grow in my faith and my love and my trust of Jesus Christ. I'm not perfectly righteous yet. I'm still in this physical flesh, this body. I'm still here. But I'm pressing on. I'm, I'm moving forward. I'm forgetting my own righteousness. It means nothing to me. It's all about Jesus. He says, but one thing I do. Forgetting those things which are behind me or behind and reaching forward to those things which are ahead. What are those things then? All of his righteous works. All of the things that he would have held on to before that he would have told you are why he's righteous. And now the only thing he's holding on to is what? Jesus Christ. That's all he's holding on to. That's all he's holding on to. Once, once again, Paul is clearly not reflecting on the, his past mistakes, but on his works of righteousness. This verse is about Paul dismantling his own pride and, and not glossing over his mistakes, right? Uh, what is Paul forgetting? His own righteousness, which is from the law. Why? To gain the righteousness which is from God by faith. As long as you're holding on to the idea that you could do enough for God to be pleased with you. You are not holding on to Jesus. And if you are in Him, God is pleased with you. Amen? Speaking of the law, another verse we love to take out of context is Galatians 5.18. Galatians 5.18. This is often quoted out of context and offered up as a defense uh, for a believer that might be doing something questionable or even sinful. And, and this would be brought up by them 
Essentially, guys, this is a more sophisticated version of don't judge me. This is just a more sophisticated way of saying don't judge me, don't judge what I'm doing. Because Galatians 5.18 says, I am not under the law. It says, I am not under the law. And therefore, listen, you can't judge me. I'm under grace. I'm not under the law. So you can't tell me if, that's, if I can do that or not. You can't tell me. A lot of people feel powerless when this one's brought up to them. They don't know how to respond. Because there's truth in this, right? Are you under the law? No, you're not under the law. If you're in Jesus Christ, if you've been saved by His righteousness, Christian, you're not under the law. And are you saved by grace? Are you in grace? Yes, this is true. Right? So so there's truth in the statement, but the, the defense they're seeking to make by that statement is where they are flawed and where they are wrong. You just need like every other verse that we've looked at, to look at the context. Just look at the context. So let's do that. Galatians 5, 16 and 18. He says, I say then, walk in the Spirit, and you shall not fulfill the lusts of the flesh. For the lust of the the flesh lusts against the Spirit, and the Spirit against the flesh. And these are contrary to one another, so that you do not do the things that you wish. But if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. So it's conditional. If you're led by the Spirit, then you're not under the law. So if someone ever says that, say, you're absolutely right. If you're led by the Spirit, then you're not under the law. I agree with you. It says it right there. Listen, the Christian life of grace, you know this, is not a license to sin. You have been saved by grace. You now live by grace. You now walk in grace. You will finish the cro- you will uh, cross the finish line by grace. When you are in heaven before his glory, it will be by grace. There will be no works involved in that. It's all his grace. And it is true that, that a Christian can sin even willfully and still be saved. This is true. Because you're not saved by not sinning, and you're not saved by doing or not doing. You're saved by believing. That's it. That's the gospel. That's the gospel truth. Listen, but any teaching or any belief that sees it this way, that grace is a license to sin, is from the devil, not the Bible. It's from the devil, not the Bible. The Bible doesn't teach us that. We're not saved by works of righteousness. We're saved by faith. But the law was never able to save us. We were never going to keep it. It is not the path of salvation. And if you're trying to save yourself by keeping the law, you will die in your sins. You cannot keep the law unto salvation. Period. But the call of the life of the Christian is holiness. And He gave us His Holy Spirit to empower us to live a life of holiness that He has called us to. This is the result of salvation, not the cause of salvation. It's the result. If I'm saved, I change because the Holy Spirit comes in me. I'm now born again. I have different desires. I have a different empowering. And I want to live in a righteous way. That's what happens when you're saved. It's not the cause It's the effect. So listen, if you need to quote, if you need to quote this verse to justify something you're doing, if you need to quote this verse to justify something you're doing, I would suggest you talk to Jesus about that thing you're doing. I just, go talk to Jesus. Okay? Because you're defending it is not righteous. Just go talk to Jesus. You take it up with Him. And then you obey whatever He tells you to do. Okay? That's where you go. Ironically, the main point and the context of this portion of Scripture 
is actually a call to holy living. Like, like, so you're taking this verse and you're defending something you're doing in a, in a section of scripture that couldn't be more blatantly talking about holy living and, and holy living in opposition to living for the flesh. And you're going to use this as an excuse for something you're doing in the flesh? If it's righteous, you don't need to defend it. You, you realize that, right? Like if you're doing, if you stand before God blameless in what you're doing, you don't need to defend it at all. And if you feel the need to, again, go back to step one, talk to Jesus about it. You go talk to Jesus about it. See what he has to say. So let's go, keep going. Verse 19. Now the works of the flesh are evident, which are adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lewdness, idolatry, sorcery, hatred, contentions, jealousies, outbursts of wrath, selfish ambitions, dissensions, heresies, envy, murders, drunkenness, revelries, and the like. You know, it's like, wow. Of which I tell you beforehand, just as I also told you in time past. This is something we've talked about, he says. That those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. There's nothing in these verses that would release a person from holy living. Nothing here. No, Paul says, listen, if you're practicing a life of the flesh, if that's the way you're living, you will not inherit the kingdom of God. You can't, you can't live there. That's not, that can't be the practice of your life and, and you think you're going to be okay. This is a call to holy living. This is a call to righteous living. As we already read in verse 16, if we walk in the Spirit, we won't what? Fulfill the lusts of the flesh. What does that look like? Verses 22 and 23. But the fruit of the Spirit is love. Joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. He says, against such, there is no law. There is no law. The fruit of the Spirit. The fruit, not fruits. The fruit of the Spirit is love. Now, you can argue with me, and that's fine. But when I read this, I think it's telling me that the fruit is love. And I think it's explaining to me what love looks like in all of the words that follow. I think the fruit of the Spirit is love. Because I take all of these same words and I go to Paul's description of love. And these are all the words he uses to describe what love looks like. Right? So, so joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness. These are all the activities of love. Right? This is the action of love. You can agree or disagree with me, but here's the thing we could all agree upon. That if I'm loving you the way I'm supposed to, I'm fulfilling the law. I'm actually doing the heart of the law. I'm doing the very thing, the law. And here's why I'm not under the law. I'm not under the thou shalt not. I'm under love thy neighbor. Right? It's totally different. I'm not under the thou shalt. I'm, un I'm under love God with all your heart. I'm under love God first, and, and my neighbor as myself. And if I do these things, I'll fulfill all that the law's heart is intending. So no, I'm not under the law. But I'm not excused from loving you. I'm not under the law, but I'm not excused from loving God above all else. Against such, he says, there is no law. There is no law. Do you, when you're being moved by the Holy Spirit, when you're being corrected or directed by the Holy Spirit, and, and maybe you are this person, but I've never had this experience. I don't personally hear, thou shalt not. No, I'm nudged towards love. I'm nudged towards forgiveness. I'm, I'm, I'm pushed towards grace. I'm pushed towards mercy. I'm pushed towards dying to myself, living for Christ, and letting you uh, take advantage of me if that's what loving you looks like. Right, that's the way I'm moved. I have a couple more. We're going to keep going because I got time. A very popular verse 
that is taken out of context is Jeremiah 29, 11, and I'm sorry. If this is one of your favorites, I'm sorry. Like I said, I'm feeling bad this morning because I'm, I'm, I'm going, we're, we're touching some of those crowd favorites, right? Jeremiah 29, 11, for I know the thoughts that I think toward you, says the Lord, thoughts of peace and not of evil to give you a future and a hope. This became very popular. I don't know when for sure. I think maybe after 9-11 in our country for sure. This really became a very, very popular verse um, quoted to each other, put everywhere. We would say it to one another to, to encourage each other that, that God's, you know, God's got good plans for us, that he's not working bad things for us. And, and this verse was quoted all over the place. Many people list this verse as a personal favorite. Maybe because it appears to offer a guarantee that in the end, life will be okay. And that the general direction we're heading is one of prosperity. The problem, listen, with that, is when our faith is based on such an idea, something really bad happens to us, we end up asking, like, how, how could God do these things? Or how could God break His promise to us? And I, I don't hear that from, from you so much, this Maybe because we teach correctly the understanding of the nature of suffering in this life and that it, it's God's uh, good work in our lives through suffering. And certainly we have no promise that we're going to escape suffering in this world. So we, we teach that faithfully and, and I think you receive that. But um, well, let's just, let's just read the context here. Jeremiah 9, or 29, pardon me, going back to verse 1, it reads... Now, these are the words of the letter that Jeremiah the prophet sent from Jerusalem to the remainder of the elders who were carried away captive. So th this is literally taken from a letter sent to captives of Israel um, brought to Babylon. It was sent to the priests, the prophets, and to all the people whom Nebuchadnezzar had carried away captive uh, from Jerusalem to Babylon. This word is not given to an individual. Like, it's, it's given to a people. And it's given to a people that have been exiled, that have been carried away from their land uh, because they are under the judgment of God. They have been rebelling over and over and over again. And God is, is well, it, when you read about what's going on here, He's actually giving the, ran, the, the land its rest. They had failed to give the land its Sabbath rest, and, and they owed it 70 years. So God's like, I'm going to give the land its rest, and you're going to go off into captivity. But, but God was not leaving these people orphans. He was not forgetting about them. God has made a covenant with the people of Israel. He, you remember, the covenant goes all the way back to Abraham. Do you remember what Abraham did? He says, God tells Abraham, I want you to take these animals and split them in two and, and, and line up the, 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 they had a ritual for making a covenant. They would, they would walk between together, walk between these animals cut in half. What a crazy picture, right? Think about it. Like there's a half a cow over here and half a cow over there, and like half a bull and, and, and half a, I don't even know what they used, right? I, I, I'd have to go back and read it. I don't remember. But they had all these animals that they cut in half. And they'd walk between them and they're basically saying, if, if we don't keep this covenant, that's you. You're going to be cut in two. And Abraham set this thing up. He's ready to go. And God puts him to sleep and walks through alone. Because it wasn't dependent on Abraham keeping anything. God was going to keep his covenant. And the people of Israel are under a covenant as a people. And God is saying to them, I'm not going to forget about you. But I got good plans for you. You have a future and you have a hope. This is spoken to Israel. Look down at verse 10. For thus says the Lord, after 70 years are completed at Babylon, I'm going to give that land 70 years of rest, but after that 70 years, I will visit you and perform my good word toward you and cause you to return to this place. This was the future and the hope and the good things that he's specifically talking to these people about. Verse 11, he says, For I know the thoughts I think toward you. They're thoughts of peace and not evil, to give you a future and a hope. 
Then you will call upon me and go and pray to me and I will listen to you. And you will seek me and find me when you search, uh, search for me with all your heart. I will be found by you, says the Lord. And I will bring you back from your captivity. I will gather you from the nations and from the places where I have uh, driven you, says the Lord. And I will bring you to the place from which I cause you to be carried away captive. And then we read about this happening, right? Nehemiah and Ezra and the building of the wall and the return of the exiles. And we see this actually take place. So th th he's already, he actually already fulfilled this for them in that sense, right? Listen, God is promising. He has promised to us, to his people, the church, that we have a future and a hope. Amen? But where is our future and our hope? Is it in our country? Is it that this country is going to come back to the Lord and, and that we're going to rebuild a, as, as a godly country? Listen, if somehow you've gotten that impression from this verse or teaching or anything, don't believe it. Don't believe it. It's not going to happen. Listen, and, and I hate to even dash your, your ideas even more so, but this was never a Christian country. This was a country that had a lot of Christians in it. And that's actually how a country is supposed to be influenced for God. That, that there are lots and lots of Christians. And, and those Christians influence the leaders because they're praying for them and, and they're taking those positions of leadership and God is raising them up and that's happening. And we've seen a lot of good things come from that. And I'm so, I'm grateful for being born in this country. I love my freedom. Thankful for it. But I'm also not in some kind of delusion that things are just going to about to turn around someday. Because it's not. The Bible doesn't give that picture. It tells us that it's going to get worse. We're going through Matthew 24 on Wednesdays, and I'm sorry, guys, it's just going to get worse. It's not going to get better. This is, our hope is an eternal hope. Our, our future is not here in this land or in this place. And ultimately, for Israel, it wasn't either. Right? They, you know, it's, it, we read Hebrews again. Read chapter 11 again. Ultimately, they were looking for a, a city that, that, that had no foundations. They were looking for a heavenly one. And that's what we're looking for. Jesus promised us in John 16.33, These things I have spoken to you, that in me you may have peace. In the world, listen, you're going to have tribulation, but... Be of good cheer. I've overcome the world. Where do we find our peace? It's in Jesus. It's in Him. It's in the resurrection. It's in my future resurrection. It's in the hope of eternal life. That's where I find my hope and peace. That's what I'm looking for. If you're going to look for it here, you're going to be disappointed. You're going to be challenged. Because it's not here. Hey, we still do justice. We do righteous. We, we do mercy. Right? We, we, we do those things. We continue to do those things. But our hope isn't here. Our hope is in Jesus. Our hope is in eternal life. I have two more and, ten, and five minutes before someone starts throwing stuff at me. Who's going to throw anything at me? Ken, are you going to throw something at me? You guys give me like 10 more minutes. Can I have it? And then you're going to stick around for a 45-minute meeting? it would be like five. Just stick around. I wanted to give you an example. I'm going to skip this one. And I'm going to go to the last one. Psalm 46.10. We're skipping the Ecclesiastes one. Psalm 46.10. It says, be still and know that I am God. Be still and know that I am God. How many of you have heard someone quote this verse and encourage you for a quiet time? We need to be still, quiet ourselves. Maybe they even went so far as to talk about emptying your mind, Right? You know, just remove all distraction, be still, and know that I am God. Um, that's actually called meditation, or maybe 
uh, contemplative prayer, and it is not taught in the scriptures. I'm told to fill my mind with the word of God, right? I'm actually told to fill my mind up with God's word. I'm never told to do that. Now, there's, there's, there, there is something that, that's healthy, right, about getting away from the noise of this world and getting alone with Jesus. Right? I'm absolutely in favor of that, and I think sometimes, well, probably none of us do that enough. But probably we're all busier than we should be, and we never take the time to just sit at his feet like, like you know, like Mary, we're, we're, we're just all being Martha. I got those right, right? Martha's the one that was running around. Sometimes we do just need to sit at his feet, but we're sitting at his feet to do what? To, to hear him. And, and where do I hear him? I hear him in his word. Listen, if you do some practice to empty your mind and then think whatever comes in is going to be from God, that is a dangerous practice. That is called transcendental meditation, and it is Eastern and New Age and dangerous. No, no, no. When we fill our mind with the word of God. So in those times when you're alone with Jesus, have your Bible open, okay? And be in the word. Pause and pray. And what does this mean? What are you, how are you speaking to me? But read his word. Right? That's, how, that's our protection. But this isn't talking about that at all. That's, that's, not, that's not here at all. That's not what this verse is saying. And um, We kind of need to read the whole, kind of just need to read the whole thing. So I'm going to read Psalm 46. Verse 1. God is our refuge and our strength, a very present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear, even though the earth be removed, and though the mountains be carried in the midst of the sea, though it is, its waters roar and be troubled, though the mountains shake with its swelling. There is a river whose streams shall make glad the city of God, the holy place of the tabernacle of the Most High. God is in the midst of her. She shall be, not be moved. God shall help her just at the break of dawn. The nations raged and the kingdoms were moved. He uttered his voice. The earth melted. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our refuge. Come, behold the works of the Lord who has made desolations in the earth. He makes wars cease to end of the earth. He breaks the bow and cuts the spear in two. He breaks the chariot of fire in the fire. Pardon me. Verse 10, our, our verse. Be still. Know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our refuge. Listen, be still here. Is a call for those involved in the war to stop fighting and be still. The word still is a translation of the Hebrew word rapa, meaning to slacken, to let down, or to cease. It's, in some instances, the word carries the idea of to drop, be weak, or faint. It connotes two people fighting until someone separates them and makes them drop their weapons. It's only after the fighting has stopped that the warriors can acknowledge their trust in God. This is about trust. This is about faith versus fear. It's about faith versus fear. It opened up. God is our refuge and our strength, the very present help in trouble. Therefore, will, uh, we will not fear. This, is, this isn't about getting alone and getting quiet. This is about s- stop, stop trying to do it in your own strength and trust God for it. That's, that's what this is saying, right? That's what this is saying. To the believer, this is about you not fighting for yourself, letting God be the one who, he's the one who ends the war. He's the one that breaks the bow. His name will be exalted. Not ours. Not ours. This this verse is so manipulated by the New Age. They will literally read it this way. Be still and know that I am God. Ah! Right? You just want to like grab them and... No! They literally read it that way. I've read it in their writings. No. He will be exalted. His name will be made great. Again, although getting along with the Lord and spending some time away from the craziness of this world, that's why we do like retreats, you know? You go, you go and you get
get into the woods and you know, get away from the hustle and bustle. But what do we do there? Do we try to empty our mind and sit quietly until there's nothing? No, no, we, we get in the Word of God, right? Like we put the Word of God in us. That's what we do. So that's just not what this is saying. And that's really, really out of context. And I'm going to end there because I ran out of time. I really wanted to get that other verse.